All right, good morning, everybody. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Just a reminder to those here in the audience to put your cell phone pagers on mute or vibrate and those at our remote sites to also put on mute or vibrate as well. Today we have the Dr. John Carabo Memorial Lecture and Dr. McCubbin is going to introduce our speaker, Dr. McCubbin. I have the honor of introducing um, Dr. Pablo Abonio, oh, Abonia, sorry, Abonia, um, from Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. Uh, he underwent his um, medical training at the University of Buffalo in New York and then his pediatric residency in, at Children's Hospital of Buffalo, also in New York, um, and then underwent his Allergy and Immunology Fellowship at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. He's certified by the American Board of Pediatrics and the American Board of Allergy and Immunology. In his clinical role in the Cincinnati Center for Eosinophilic Disorders, or CCED, um, he is focused upon eosinophils and mast cells and their role in disease, such as eosinophilic esophagitis and primary mast cell diseases. He is currently conducting translational research and is an investigator for NIH, PCORI, and an industry-sponsored multi-center clinical trials for the treatment of eosinophilic esophagitis. Is the primary supervisor of their registries for eosinophilic gastrointestinal disorders. He is directly involved in the continuing development of patient data, ba data banks and bioinformatic approaches at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. The utilization and intermingling of these clinical and research resources has allowed for deep phenotypic analysis analyses that have helped develop have helped to identify and define new eosinophilic esophagitis subtypes, such as the subtype related to connective tissue disorders. He, um, Dr. Abonia is a member of the NIH-supported consortium of eosinophilic gastrointestinal researchers whose primary goals are to facilitate research and extend education regarding EOE, eosinophilic gastritis, and eosinophilic colitis nationwide. So let's give a welcome to Dr. Pablo Abonia. Good morning, and thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I'm here today for the John M. Kariba Lectureship. I'm very glad to have been invited by Dr. Andrea Adriana McCubbins today. Um, from what I understand, he's a very nice young gentleman long ago and who is part of the Air Force. Uh, as an Air Force, uh, ultimately, Brigadier General, he ended up flying air, uh, airplanes such as the F-86 Sabre and as, as, as well as the Canberra. He trained up in Cincinnati um, as well uh, after doing a, a residency training here in UFL, if I believe correctly. And at the same time, uh, as a clinical director in Audio and Audio, he was involved in training both medical residents and fellows. Today, for this lectureship, what I'm going to be discussing is going to be eosinophilic esophagitis. Um, as far as my disclosures are concerned, um, no major conflicting financial interests whatsoever. However, I'm going to be discussing some off-label aspects as far as treatment of EOE is concerned, meaning the use of both swallowed steroid therapies and elemental formulas. Um, as far as the objectives for today, we're going to look at and figure out how to go ahead and do uh, all the need, need, important things that you need, need to do before you actually make a formal diagnosis of esophagitis. On top of that, uh, I'm going to discuss some new phenotypes for those of you, uh, sub-phenotypes for those of you who are aware with EOE. They're not just one problem. There are also some sub-problems that you have to deal with with those patients as well. Uh, I'll define some of the testing options, what is actually needs to be done to actually get appropriate testing for these patients. I will also go ahead and review the treatment options for these patients, meaning dietary, swallowed steroid therapies, and even things like esophageal dilation. To start off with, and I was asked to basically create a case study. And this is basically a typical kind of case for esophagitis. And I've made this person up. So we'll call him Ed. Um, Ed's a five-year-old young gentleman who's had long-standing problems with gastrointestinal complaints in one kind or another, from his parents, that is. And as an infant, he was vomiting, frankly, projectile vomiting, is one of the first words mom uses for you when she actually enters the door. 
uh, got treated with a variety of different anti-reflux medications, meaning things like Zantac or the, uh, other H2 blockers, also meaning things like proton pump inhibitors. All of this resulting basically in middling improvements in disease process. Uh, even the use of things like some partially hydrolyzed formulas did not entirely make this better. It simply made it more tolerable for the family and more than anything else. Um, feeding him has also always been a bit of a challenge. So when you try to feed him, he's always pushing things away. Uh, he oftentimes refuses food that he sometimes ate in the past, and he takes forever to eat. We're just constantly, constantly weighing on him, perhaps a little bit more so than we would ordinarily expect in a child who's um, just five years of age. Now, as far as symptoms are concerned, he is known to have, right now, vomiting eh, one or two times a month. Maybe not that bad as you might be, you know. Sometimes I'll get families who come in and say, hey, he vomits one or two times a month, and that's their normal. They don't really recognize that as being terribly abnormal. He certainly isn't getting acute gastroenteritis with this kind of stuff. It's just a puke, and he's basically off and running uh, immediately. There are also some oftentimes problems with constipation, and he's using things like laxatives to basically get that better under control. He complains about his stomach or hurting, but it's not as if it's localized to any single spot. He's still too young to really demonstrate that, yeah, it hurts here when he's uh, having problems with swallowing. And when you look at the family history and you actually ask mom uh, about her problems with food getting stuck, oftentimes she'll say, yeah, well, I got food in my stuck throat stuck maybe weekly. And that's been occurring since she was in her teenagers or back in high school. So very, very common presentation for a patient who has EOE. Certainly not a diagnosis of EOE. So when you're trying to make the actual criteria, make that established like diagnosis, we got to follow some criteria for EOE. Now EOE is relatively straightforward as far as the criteria are concerned. Basically, you have to have an endoscopy. Uh, from time to time, I'll have patients come in and tell me that they have have EOE and have never actually had an endoscopy done, done on them. So it's hard for me to believe them until I actually have that done. And when they do the actual biopsy on that uh, sample, they have to have at least 15 years in a postpyroporic field. Now, this is in the context of trying to establish that you're not one of two other primary self folk disorders of the esophagus. Those two disorders, which I'll go into in a little bit more detail later, include uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease and another lovely disease that goes by the name of proton pump inhibitor responsive esophageal eosophilia, which probably is more easily said trademark PPI name used twice a day, uh, and that makes me better, whereas I don't need to use the sort of therapies that I have to use for EOE, meaning your swallowed steroid therapies and your dietary therapies. Alternatively, um, as far as making that diagnosis, you could consider using something like an impedance probe or a pH probe, although uh, that's a little bit more controversial, and most of the times most patients don't end up having that done. Now, eosophagitis is just not a singular, singular disorder of the uh, eosophagus themselves. There are other problems going on at the same time, meaning that there are increases in mast cells, there's also basal cell hyperplasia, and also lymphocytic infiltration of the esophagus going on at the same time. Grossly, when you look at the esophagus, um, under normal conditions, you're basically able to easily see veins throughout, and it's pretty smooth. There's nothing special about this type of esophagus whatsoever. However, when you look at EOE, what you're going to start end up seeing is problems with fur wing, and down through here. You can have problems with wings in this area as well. And you can sometimes have these little exudates that sometimes gets mistaken for uh, candidal esophagitis. Now, one thing I would noticed in the previous slide is you can easily see the vessels, but here they're basically ablated by the fact that there's all this infl infiltration of different uh, immune cells as well as the changes in the basal cell uh, zone. So another thing to remind yourself about EOE is that, yeah, you can have all this going on and have EOE, but from the normal esophagus, you can also have an entirely normal appearing esophagus and still have evidence of EOE on the actual biopsies. One key for the gastroenterologist is also that you have to make multiple actual biopsies to actually establish the diagnosis. Uh, it's a patchy disease. So when you actually do a biopsy from a single location, you're at risk for actually missing the process. However, if you do four to five biopsies from each different segment of the uh, esophagus that you're worrying about, whether it's distal, middle, or proximal, that should be more than sufficient to really establish that you actually clearly have a problem with EOE or not. 
Now, looking at the histology here, you can basically go back and look at what you're looking at the normal esophagus on this side. Back over here. So here, you're not seeing any eosinophils whatsoever. Uh, the basal cell layer is nice and thin, one or two cell layers thick. Uh, you're not getting any sort of lymphocytic infiltration whatsoever. And uh, the basal cell layer doesn't really go all the way up towards here. On the other hand, with eosinophil esophagitis, you're getting eosinophils at multiple different locations whatsoever throughout this entire area. You also get little microabscesses, those little white spots that you saw as etsidate on the gross. They actually are actual eosinophils, not the fungal elements I had mentioned beforehand. So um, this is what it looks like on a plain old H&E stain. To look at mast cells, however, basically um, you need to actually have uh, tryptase staining, tryptase representing a protease of the mast cell uh, that's relatively specific for the mast cell. The only other cell that sometimes has that seen showing up there would be the basal cell, but that kind of depends upon what type of animal you're dealing with. Again, for your normal patients, a nice thin layer for the basal cell layer. Mast cells are basically all over your body and find them everywhere. So I do have like one or two here. But when you get into esophagitis, they're increased. And they're now above the basal cell layer. They're actually increased in within the basal cell layer itself. And it's roughly approximately a two-fold increase in the number of mast cells uh, as compared to the normal situation. Excuse me, normal situation. This slide better establishes what's going on with this basal cell layer. Again, very thin here and rather thick through here extending oftentimes all the way up to the surface of the es uh, esophagus. Now, in that context, when you think about that vascularity that we talked about earlier on, that vascularity is basically ablated by the fact that you have too many cells here. You got a very thick little layer through here. And uh, all those vessels are basically uh, up, uh, up, uh, obscured by the fact that you have this thick layer on top of them. Now, and when you look at mast cells, as I mentioned already, they are clearly found in normal patients. They're everywhere, uh, and, but they are increased in the urine patients as well. Now we'll move forward and just talk about a little bit about the epidemiology of the disease process. Uh, eosinophil esophagitis actually represents a disease that tends to have a male predominance. Uh, roughly 66 to 75 percent of patients are going to have demonstrable, uh, are going to be male as far as the disease process is concerned. And that's held up in just about every single study that you've ever come across. Uh, it's a worldwide disease. You can pretty much find it anywhere on almost all the continents. It is generally thought to be a problem with uh, white patients for the most part. However, I'd take some care with that. It's not a distinguishing feature of the disease by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, and the way it presents can be a little bit different depending upon what race you are as well. For example, when you're looking at African-American patients, they oftentimes, one of the things I have, haven't mentioned before is that eosophagitis has a lot of atopy associated with it, meaning that there are problems with asthma, seasonality, and eczema, as well as uh, food allergies. But when you look at patients who are African American, uh, who are in gray, they basically are doing the same thing as the white patient population for just about everything except for eczema here. Eczema is obviously rather increased in that patient population. On top of that, their symptoms are a little bit different. Uh, and particularly for the residents, you know, oftentimes when you're thinking of things like failure to thrive, one of your first things to think about is mainly a social issue. Well, one of the things you also have to worry about as far as the African-American patient population, well, failure to thrive might actually be a marker for problems with esophagitis, right? Because uh, this is roughly 50%, it's about 9% as far as the Caucasian patient population. In addition, they tend to vomit a bit more than their peers do. So listening for those kind of problems in this patient population, especially for the kid who's small, who's got problems with eczema and who's vomiting, that's something that might clue you in that you have to have to deal with a little bit more and think about that as being a problem for these patients, for that patient population. Now, um, uh, similar things are going to probably hold true for other patient populations. One of the key things that I haven't mentioned yet is the frequency. Uh, it's probably simply because of having a larger white population in the United States. That's all it is. Because when you look at the actual frequency, it's almost identical between the two, especially when you take into account the number of times you get endoscopies. Uh, if you get endoscopies in a Caucasian patient or a white patient versus an African-American patient, much more likely to occur in a, a white patient than in an African-American patient. And when you uh, modify 
uh, what you're looking at as a consequence, then you say, okay, guess what? It's actually there, so it's something to consider for these patients. Now, it's also a very familial disease. And really, when you look at the familiar aspect about it, it's like I'll see between four to five patients with UE every single week. And of those patients, I would say someplace between one-third to probably around one-third of those patients are actually going to have other family members who actually have actual fundamental problems with UE. So whenever I'm working with a family who has UE, I say, okay, i got to make sure that something about other issues going on. Hence, in our case with Edward, or Ed as we know him, um, you're just looking to say, okay, does mom have actual problems with this disorder? Mom will almost always have the symptoms, but she almost always will never actually have an abnormal, bio an abnormal biopsy. So if you have dad with symptoms, I think you're a little bit more likely to actually find an abnormal biopsy in terms of familia. As far as when you compare those familial versions with the kind of sporadic cases that just come out of the blue, there's really no significant difference in a study done by Dr. Collins over at TCHMC uh, back in 2008. So as far as I'm concerned, they basically are the same type of process, but for some reason there's a familial predilection for some certain families. Incidence as far as EOE is concerned is relatively rare, although increasing in general. Uh, I would say that you're dealing with an incidence of about 1 to 10,000 at this point. Uh, it's probably a very solid number that most people are going to agree with. However, there have been some more recent studies which said, yes, it might be increasing to about 1 in 1,000. To give you some perspective, if you look at inflammatory bowel disease, IBD is around almost 1 in 10,000. So this is something that if you're seeing IBD, you probably should be also seeing problems with EOE in, in your patient population. From a prevalence point of view, it's a little bit more variable depending upon where in, your world, where in the world you are. In the United States, we're looking at about 7 in 10,000. Uh, that's data out of CCHMC. And whereas in Western Australia, the only study I know down there, you, they're looking at rate only about 1 in 10,000. So uh, relatively rare disease, but uh, something that has increased over time, probably simply because of recognition, meaning that we're doing more scopes in these patients, rather than an actual increase in the disease uh, frequency. Now, common clinical present presentations as far as ESL and esophagitis are concerned are relatively multifold. Um, Meaning that as far as pediatric patients you look at, you have that early problem with that having the feeding intolerance, vomiting all the time, being thrown on a variety of different anti-reflux medications, which each, of one, each thing you do has a little bit of a benefit, but doesn't really doesn't completely successfully resolve the problem. Oftentimes we'll have uh, some substernal plan as they get a little bit oral, they're able to actually differentiate and say, yeah, it actually hurts in my chest. Um, and off sometimes with uh, food impactions. The key aspect here is that from my perspective, when you're looking at some of these kids as they're growing through this age, it tends to be kind of two areas where you see them, either very, very young or as teenagers. Now, the very, very young patients are the kids who, whose symptoms are vomiting and food intolerance and are, are basically so severe that the family can no longer handle them. That's when they end up showing up with, in you before they're five years of age. However, if they get through that, you know, first grade period of time and they're just vomiting every once in a while, the family takes it in stride and then because they've got continuous chronic kind of injury ha occurring to the esophagus, when they get to teenage years or their young adult years, they show up in the emergency room with food stuck in their throat. So um, that's the two differentiating kind of thing. Also that vomiting thing that you had as a child, when you get to be an adult, that kind of disappears. You start with the swallowing difficulties. If you do have problems with food impact and actually getting esophageal dilations, it's the very, very, very rare patient that gets an esophageal patient, uh, esophageal dilation as a pediatric patient. Uh, they will complain of abdominal pain. Diarrhea is not a distinguishing feature between the two. They can ha both can have problems with diarrhea. Why that's occurring is not entirely clear. And sometimes they'll have weight loss. Uh, that's not a very common feature for the adults, but it does occur. For the kids, it's simply a problem with the, the inability to grow. Now, when you try to diagnose these patients, one of the first things you got to do is exclude other uh, things from your differential diagnosis. So chief among them, uh, whenever you're thinking about ESL philia, whether it's isolated to the esophagus or within the circular blood, is to find some of the infectious causes. Looking for parasites, looking at your stools, doing your, doing your serologic studies to see whether or not there's anything there. Most of the times, you're not going to find it. 
uh, even when you're doing stools out to like seven stools on these patients. You just generally don't. They usually don't have a travel history that screams, aha, uh, you've been there and that's why you're having the ESL filia, not only in your blood but also in your esophagus. Um, you also have to worry about neurologic causes of UE. Oftentimes we'll see patients who have problems with RLKRA malformations or, or, and you basically get the MRI and it's like, okay, that's where your issues are and you get that repaired. Some of them will achieve resolution of their problems but not all of them. So we actually have a fairly large cadre of patients who have those kinds of problems within our, our group, within our group up at CCHMC. Now, uh, as I already mentioned, you have to actually have uh, the proton pump inhibitor daily for about two months. Here's where you're going to start trying to differentiate between the different kinds of problems that you have with ESL filled disorders of the esophagus. So when you look at the esophagus and swallowing difficulties, whether it's reflux, whether it's a proton pump inhibitor responsive disease, or ESL esophagitis, all of them have too many ESL folds in the esophagus. And it leads to this kind of conundrum that you have to deal with. We're saying, okay, do I have which of these disorders? So when it's plain old reflux disease, when I talk to my families about this, I say, okay, um, if you use your anti-reflux medications, whether the CH2 blockers or the proton pump inhibitors, use that once a day for a few days and you're basically better until the next time something goes wrong. Uh, for the proton pump inhibitor disease, however, that once a day dose is just not going to cut it. It's going to stay there. You're going to still have symptoms. You're going to have to have the ESL affiliate in your esophagus in spite of being on that once a day dose of a proton pump inhibitor. When you, when you build that up to twice a day, however, suddenly the ESL flows go away as well as the some of the symptoms oftentimes go away as well. Finally, when you're looking at issues with frank ESL esophagitis, it laughs at once a day, twice a day, your H2 blockers, none of that seems to matter. You might get some changes along the margins as far as reducing ESL filia, but you're not going to be able to achieve full-fledged resolution of the ESL filth inflammation. So a study by Evan Dillon down in North Carolina establishes this kind of stuff. Now, this is an adult study, but I think it gives, uh, helps you understand a little bit more about what's going on. We looked at nearly 600 patients, right? Uh, screened them for uh, problems with uh, any sort of issues with dysphagia or not without dysphagia, and basically did, did the endoscopies and said, okay, what happens when they're on their PPIs? When they have dysphagia, they had an endoscopy with more than 50 ESFLs, for our prior fill, we had about 66 patients at this end. And then he said, okay, let's see what happens after you've gotten a high dose PPI. Well, 14% of his patients actually responded to that high dose PPI. So before we had issues where everybody was worried about PPIs for neurologic problems and bony problems, this was an easy thing to say, oh, this is something I'd certainly want to go ahead and try to do and say, let's give you just a pill once a day and, and get you through your problem. Uh, but then nowadays it's a little bit more nebulous of an answer because now do I want to have those kinds of risks for using the PPIs all the time? Uh, or do I want to consider potentially using a swallowed steroid therapy or, or a dietary restriction to try to make improvements there? Right now, it's certainly possible that either one of these could potentially get a little bit better with uh, therapies of the other type. So, I will mention one other thing about this, if it's too small for anybody to see, but I'll summarize it quickly. There have been a lot of studies looking at proton pump inhibitor responsiveness in patients in UE, and the range of patients in responsiveness is pretty high, at least in adults. You're looking at 33 to 74% of patients actually responding to high dose PPI in terms of supposedly re resolving their um, ESL affiliate. I have I just don't believe this high number. It's just not uh, something I, I believe at all. I would think it's probably between the 15 to 30 percent that's been reported as a much more lower number. That's much more likely because in the patients who are at least coming into the tertiary center, the CCD, uh, it's usually not that common at all. And even the patients that we identify ourselves. Now, here we have a bunch of diseases that are all very similar to each other in terms of ESL filia. They vary in their response in terms of, say, their proton pump inhibitors. But one of the things that we did early on 
was established what's called a transcriptome for years of esophagitis. So does that transcriptome vary across these disease processes? Yes and no. So here's a normal patient, and when you look at these kinds of things as far as transcriptomes are concerned, each, each individual column represents a patient, whereas each individual row represents a particular gene. So if you're red on a particular row, what that means is that you're increased relative to your normals. If you're blue on a particular row, it means you're decreased relative to the normal situation. So here's an all patient, what their profile looks like, over across about 70 different genes, more or less. And here's a reflux patient. They're almost identical, right? On the other hand, you have EOE. This entire pattern is basically inverted. Then you look at proton pump inhibitor response in esophageal and sclerophilia, and you get in the study by Ting Wen. And what you end up finding is that it's almost identical. Look at this. I've got EOE over here, and I've got PPIRE here before the PPI. Then after the PPI, what happens? It looks just like the GERD in a normal situation. Now, all these different genes as you go down are very similar to one another. And when you use higher stringency kind of things, there are only four genes that are different across about 70 there uh, among these disease processes. So I'm a little hard for us to say that's entirely different disease. Right? Especially when you start using things like higher stringencies when, for these transcriptomes, you realize that there's only a single gene that's different between the two. And that single gene happens to be a potassium inwardly rectifying channel, which potentially could be playing a role uh, with a proton pump inhibitor. So from my perspective, they're very similar. There are studies that suggest that you might be able to treat PPRE with either a swallowed steroid or uh, either swallow storage or dietary management, but it's not, you know, no one really knows that yet by any stretch of imagination. So I'm an allergist, um, if you hadn't noticed already. Uh, and so my side of things is basically looking at the allergy side and seeing what's going on from that point of view. There's a lot of atopic disease, as I've already mentioned. And what we tend to do is try to manage their ongoing problems that they're having along with the EOE, as well as giving some guidance what to do with diet. So as far as helping along with that, think about the process that you're dealing with with esophagitis. Most of these kids, when they're coming in with stuffy noses, have the worst noses I have across the board. So here I have a disease process where their esophagus has this infiltration of eosinophils, mast cells, and lymphocytes, and it's responding inappropriately and causing kids to vomit. Then I've got the nasal congestion and pretty bad post-nasal drip. That's getting back into my stomach and making me sick and making me vomit. On top of that, I may have some neurologic issues, meaning dysautonomia, which I'll get to a little bit later on, that also will make me vomit. If you try to just control one of these things, you're probably going to not entirely fail. Not everybody's got the nasal problems. Not everybody's got the dysautonomia. Everybody's got the, um, the swallowing difficulties as a consequence of EOE, but anything that makes it worse needs to basically be dealt with. So with its seasonal allergies, you do skin prick testing, you do avoidance for the things that you can avoid. Certainly allergy shots can be considered for these patients. Um, and they can be helpful as far as dealing with the stuffy nose problems. And it's totally ambivalent about whether or not it has any impact, uh, either positive or negative, as far as EOE. There are papers going both ways for, for either one. Um, so we also do skin testing for the foods. Now, the foods that we do skin tests for, are kind of limited, and I'll get into that a little bit when we talk about the diet aspects of this. Uh, it used to be that I tested for just about every food uh, that I had available. I don't do that anymore because I just focus on foods that are part of what we call the empiric elimination diet, which represents foods that are commonly associated with uh, anaphylaxis. Uh, we used to do something called ATP patch testing, which is basically like your uh, metal patch testing and things of that nature. Uh, we don't do that anymore. It never really demonstrated that we actually had that much more benefit uh, over what we get from skin prick testing. And what we generally see is that if you use a variety of different dietary managements and with or without skin testing, you actually get pretty decent results. We do coordinate very closely with registered dietitians to try to achieve appropriate nutrition. There are quite often times problems with uh, their nutrition in terms of their vitamins. They oftentimes have low vitamin D. Uh, having issues with CoQ10 is also very common in these patient populations. And uh, we oftentimes have to supplement. 
making sure they have to have an adequate diet, uh, especially in the context of the restrictions that we impose upon these families, is also quite important. Now, another allergy concern that we have to deal with is problems with food anaphylaxis. So here I do these skin tests on all these patients, and let's say I do skin tests for milk, egg, and wheat. They're all positive, but the kid's been eating milk, the kid's been eating eat egg, the kid's been eating wheat. Now, if they've been having symptoms to milk, for example, the vomiting as a baby, then I'm going to say, yeah, that's going to probably be a real problem. If, on the other hand, they're having no symptoms, never had problems with milk whatsoever, I'm not quite so sure anymore. Uh, save for the fact that milk is the single most notorious player with regards to AOE. Uh, if they have problems with egg, they're not having symptoms with egg, again, I'm thinking the same thing. It's not that important. If they have symptoms and they have a positive test, I'm going to be much more suspicious about that food being a real problem as far as AOE is concerned. But these skin tests were actually designed for anaphylaxis. You know, you eat the peanut, you have the hive, you end up in the emergency room. They're eating all these foods and they're vomiting. Right? There's a differentiation between what you're seeing with aphylaxis and the differentiation between what you're seeing what you're seeing with AOE. So when I'm talking to families about this, I tell them only about one five patients is going to actually have frank aphylaxis when they eat a food. As far as I know, there have been absolutely no deaths related to aphylaxis in patients who have AOE. Now, I could be very arrogant and say, because I'm such a great doc, I'm not that foolish. I much more suspect that it's much more likely a consequence of what's there going on with the actual disease process. The disease process, yeah, causes esophagitis, but in general, even if they have anaphylaxis, they're not leading to frank, most severe stuff that puts you into the hospital. You know, that hospitalizes you and lets you at least ICU and perhaps to death. There are patients who clearly end up in the emergency room, but hardly anybody ever goes beyond that. Now, um, <laughs> I have that on one side. I warn them about what's going on with anaphylaxis. Then I say, okay, here's what's going on with regards to your UE. Let's remove those foods and see whether or not it has any impact on your esophageal biopsies. Then we start reintroducing those foods and see if that makes you better. Uh, so when I talk to them about anaphylaxis, I say, I'm going to give you an EpiPen, but I'm only going to give it to pens, people who actually have that problem with anaphylaxis. If you don't, I don't think it's necessary at all. Uh, you're probably doing them a disservice by making them so frightened about food at that stage, and these patients are very frightened about food, uh, that giving an EpiPen is not going to really help them out from my perspective. Only those patients who have frank problems with anaphylaxis. Now, to give you some numbers from the problems that we were seeing with atopy in these patients, you have seasonal allergy, which is extremely common, 60% you know, of the patient population. This is data that we just have over at Cincinnati Children's. Eczema, fairly common, 43% of the patient population. Most of the times it's just moderate. Every once in a while it's severe, and if you see severe, it's probably more likely to be in your African-American patients. Hives are extremely common, and most of the times these are ignored. You know, these are patients who come in and say, I have hives three, four, five times a week, and it's just another thing. They just get hives. They're a little bit itchy. They probably don't use an antihistamine with it. And um, it's if I get a patient who's complaining about Bombing and getting hives, I start becoming much more suspicious I've got issues with it in the stiffle GI disorder. Asthma is relatively prevalent in the patient population, again, more so than the general population around more of it. But for the most part, it's fairly mild. Uh, it's relatively easy to deal with. Oftentimes, they're just using albuterol uh, prior to exercise. Sometimes it's more severe, and sometimes it's actually just EOE manifesting in a way that makes it seem as though it's asthma. So they have bad asthma, they've been coughing and, and off and on for post tussive emesis. They're having difficulties with breathing. They get their steroid doses and they get a little bit better that they keep getting built up and built up and built up. Then they get treated for AOE and suddenly a lot of their asthma problems go away. And you can curtail some of their asthma medications thereafter. So it, it can be, asthma can be a mimic of AOE uh, and, and particularly any patient who's getting Worsening asthma or asthma that's difficult to control would be some of my concerns. Is this EOE? And if it is EOE, can I do something about it that's making things better? Um, as far as EOE's pathogenesis is concerned, what you're looking at here is yes, error allergens can cause problems as far as EOE is concerned. Uh, in particular, things like trees. We have some patients who have EOE, perhaps only the seasonal kind of variations with EOE. They have Problems during the springtime. 
They oftentimes also have what's called oral allergy syndrome or itching when they eat things like apples. Uh, food allergy is a much more common problem uh, for these patients, with milk being chief among them. Here you have, uh, as far as EOE is concerned, you have mast cells in here. You have eosinophils increase, lymphocytes increase. They're in places they're really not supposed to be. Um, the main chemokines that they're looking at are going to be eotatin 3 and TGF beta 1. Eotatin 3 is roughly 23 fold increase, and it's basically a chemokine that draws eosinophils to a particular location. TGF beta 1 is oftentimes thought of being as an anti inflammatory kind of process, but it's made by both mast cells and eosinophils and happens to be increased in esophagitis. Um, when you look at some work out of semen, from the semen assembly group, you see that TGF beta 1 is here. When you mark it with that triptase marker uh, for mast cells, it's here. And when you do um, overlay them, you basically find they're actually occurring in the same location. That's occurring down in this muscular layer. It's not really occurring up over in this area over here. In addition, uh, this is an interesting patient, patient uh, population. You look at TGF beta 1, not just the eosinophils, it's increasing the eo patients. You apply that onto a, a smooth muscle gel, nothing there, it basically helps to contract. So if I've got these cells within a muscular layer, potentially causing contraction, causing irritation within that area, causing frank fibrosis and making it less elastic, well, maybe that might be a good reason why going from here to here causes you to have difficulty with swallowing. Uh, if more TGF beta that you put on, the less area that you have on this in particular location. And here it's just showing some increases. Now, the interesting aspect about TGF beta 1 is that it plays a role in connective tissue disorders. Uh, probably most prominently would be Marfan syndrome. Uh, in Marfan syndrome, you have defects in FBN1 that lead to increases in TGF beta 1. And uh, studies that are seen in the Journal of Medicine from Dr. Dietz's group where they use things like the sarin, uh, demonstrates that you can reduce the problems with aortic dil uh, dilations in those patients by giving them the sarin. Now, if you're just thinking mechanically, you'd say, oh, it's because you're lowering the blood pressure and you're not causing that, that blood pressure to cause issues. Not really that. It's actually changing what's happening with TGF beta 1. It's reducing the activity of that, of that pathway. So as it turns out, um, when you look at patients who have EOE, they also have connective tissue disorders. Uh, and there's about an eight-fold increased risk of having EOE if you have a connective tissue disorder along the lines of a Marfan or an Ellis Danlos syndrome. So these are a couple of my patients who have EOE with some features of Marfan kind of problems. It's the same sort of microarray that I showed you earlier with the same uh, coming from our beam. You're looking at normal patients here, you're looking at EOE patients here, and then EOE CPD, these connective tissue disorder patients over here on this side. They're a little bit different than the other patients in that, one, they have reduced collagen. They have type A2, type 4 collagen within this town. So here's something that's structurally involved with the disease process that could potentially be causing issues as far as EOE is concerned. They have reduced, it's a charming name, reduced negative regular prostaglandin receptors. So look at the EOE patients, here's your normal, here's your EOE, and then EOE CPD for the collagen. Here's your normal, here's your EOE, and then EOE CPD for the prostaglandins. These patients oftentimes will actually have increases in their urinary prostaglandins, uh, a, a marker of mast cells and just very strong eosinophils. So mast cell markers down here, again, normal EOE, increase in your connective tissue patients. And another mast cell marker, increase in your connective tissue patients as well. This is the data that basically shows you that you have that increase in the EOE CPD. It doesn't make it obvious what's going on here, but what you end up doing is, for this particular study, which we went ahead and counted the number of patients who had Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So you get one in 10,000, whatever that number is. You count the number of patients who have esophagitis, one in 10, or whatever that is. You have overlap in those two, two very infrequent kind of things, and it's increased above your normal patient population. That's where you get, oh, it's eightfold increase beyond that. I'm not going to run through the numbers for that, but basically that provides the explanation of what you're seeing there. So the percentage really is the bottom line thing. You're going from 1.3 here and 0 0.8, I believe, to 3.3 in this area. The other, the other clear, clear aspect about this 
is that uh, you have pretty hypermobile patients. So Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, this is patients that I have seen Just a second. All right. So this is a patient that I saw who has EOE and also has Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Um, you're just seeing him in profile now, and you can see how bendy his legs are. He's from nine to ten years old, quite mobile. Not all patients are like this. He's a unique example. Way bouncy shoulders uh, that you have there, and you think, okay, it's unusual that you can have that much flexibility. Here's another young gentleman. A little bit older, he's got stretch marks on his back horizontally going up. Stretch marks on his back right there for a second. His shoulders are, you know, he pops them out. Not too bad. And that comes down. And he can touch his ear. And all the way around. And then finally, his feet. Again, this is a relatively severe case as far as their mobility is concerned. Most of the times, it's pretty modest, right? But this is what you can see in some of these patients. It isn't just the kids, though. It's also the adults. So this gentleman is my age, almost 50, uh, almost. And he can put his leg above his head. Quite happy to do so. He's also got, had the misfortune to actually have back surgery already. So more serious aspects about this is actually knowing that if you have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, if you're looking at patients who have EOE, look for it. If you find it, then make sure they're not having joint issues and send them down the way to physical therapy so they basically have a chance to basically be better as far as their uh, joints are concerned. Like I said, these are the extremes. Most of them just have you know, their thumbs and their elbows and that kind of stuff. But these are pretty common problems for them. In addition, these patients often have problems with dysautonomia that I talked about earlier. They stand up and they become lightheaded because all the blood is suddenly rushing from their brains. And they get nauseous and vomit as a consequence of just the lightheadedness and the POTS that we're often seeing in this patient population. Remember Ed? He has a constipation issue, right? Some of these patients, particularly the girls, will go out to like four or seven days without having a bowel movement. It's pretty severe. Um, and managing that can also be important as far as making sure that their entire problems as far as their GI symptoms and their POTS and those issues are improved. Major therapeutic regimens that we use for ERE are listed here. And we have the first is the elimination diet based on skin fit tests and the HSV patch test. Uh, Dr. Spermel up in Philadelphia will still use the HSV patch test, but our results suggest that's really not all that important anymore. You have the sit food elimination diet which is what we use very heavily nowadays, which is no milk, no egg, no wheat, no peanuts, no peanuts, fish, no soy, no shellfish. That's not sits, that's eight, isn't it? So um, when you look at that, what you have to say is actually they call the empirical elimination diet. It sits for you because tree nuts got added in and shellfish got added, and depending upon who you're arguing with, you're going to say yeah, it's sits food, eight food, or whatever you want to call it. I like to call it the empirical elimination diet because all it's based upon is by the fact that when you look at food allergy in general, those are the foods that cause the vast majority of anaphylactic-based food allergies. And what Dr. Kyra Wall up in Chicago did said, you know what, I don't have an allergist. I'm going to go ahead and remove all these foods from these patients and see what happens. If you do just that, 68% of your patient population is going to get better. However, it's not easy. And... Uh, Think about just avoiding one food, milk. The worst food I've got here. I've got milk, I've got cheese, I've got ice cream, I've got yogurt. That's all gone. That's going to make life difficult for a pediatric patient by any stretch of the imagination. But if you have to get away with wheat, egg, soy, peanuts, tree nuts, fish, and shellfish, what's left to eat after that? You have vegetables, you have some fruits. Really not enough to be a fundamentally adequate diet as far as I'm concerned. There is a milk elimination diet that's becoming more of more interest. We actually have a nas national clinical trial ongoing with that for both adults and pediatric patients. Elemental formulas are the single most effective thing, bar none, as far as getting rid of the esophagus and esophagus. 
90 to 95% of patients who are on elemental diet will get better and get rid of really good cell phones without vomiting. The uh, elemental formula, however, is not a very pleasant diet. And the problem with EOE is that it's a chronic disease. I don't fix you, I manage you as far as you need. So as a consequence, you're on long-term elemental formulas, you're on long-term swallowed steroid therapies with either uh, reticosone or homocort with Splenda. Or if you have the misfortune of being an adult, all of us do, you have, end up getting esophageal dilations and not just one esophageal dilation. So here we have the steroid inhalers as far as what they do to the cell counts. They all start off high. This is a high dose trial. They get their screening numbers. All of them are actually above this 15 level here. They drop down to three in, in this particular phase back here. We see if we can curtail their dose. This is 880 micrograms of uh, reticosone twice a day over here. And then this is 440 of reticosone twice a day here. So it looks as though you can potentially make people better by giving them a high dose and then going back to a low dose, going as far as EOE is concerned. But some of those patients are going to break through and apparently will likely have to require either higher dose steroids or dietary management along with swallowed steroid therapies. Uh, similarly, this is another one. This is for budesonide mixed with Splenda, or actually mixed uh, with another special mixture made by this particular company. Again, before therapy, very high eosinophil counts, again, above the 15 eosinophil high power field, and basically mocking just about everybody down to normal to normalcy thereafter. With a placebo, with a PPI, some are actually getting pretty much better. Here's one PPI uh, RE patient in this particular group right there. Not everybody gets all the way better, and a lot of patients do actually get better, but most of them are above a bottom line level. Again, this is only for three months, but it's one of the things that suggests that we have similar disorders that are now complicated by the fact that PPIs have their own problems inherent to them. Now, not only do the syphilis get better, but the mast cells actually get better. This is work from Dr. Severs' group out in San Diego. Four treatments, this is the number of mast cells we had. Afterwards, in the responders, it drops down to here. For those people who did not respond, their mast cells basically stable, their eosinophils stayed high. Again, looking at the lamina propria, this is basically an epithelium. The lamina propria, the mast cells are only barely budging a little bit. Here's responders, these people responded, but the mast cells stayed st relatively high. Same thing over here. Dietary restriction also has to have a big high impact. Now, I mentioned the fact that we have different diets. Elemental formulas over here, almost everybody got better. Uh, one patient on this, only two patients on this list actually did not get better as far as being on elemental formula. However, elemental formulas, like I've already mentioned, are difficult to do. The sits free elimination diet, oops, this is our data. Again, the vast majority of patients are getting better. And this is what we did with the skin PRIV testing. Well, it actually looks a little bit worse. Here's where the problem lies with that. This is during a period of time when we tested for everything. So if I get a test for not only the sits foods, but uh, I don't know, 10 other foods if you have to avoid two, is that going to be any easier than avoiding sits foods? Is that going to be any easier to manage? From my perspective, I think what you could do with this type of thing is focus on the foods that are empirical elimination diet. Any food that's caused an anaphylaxis outside of that particular group, you'll probably get results that are going to be a bit better than this. Uh, Dr. Spergel's group actually has data that suggests you can go ahead and do that. Same here. As far as dietary successes, how are you testing alone? In this particular case, we're looking at milk avoidance alone, milk with certain uh, disease, uh, milk, egg, and wheat diet, this food elimination diet around here, milk, egg, wheat, and soy. And this is the last group where you do everything, allergy testing and milk at the same time. So from my perspective, there is a possibility of actually doing this a little bit more effectively. I think if you focus just on the foods of the empiric elimination diet, you can actually get some decent results. Now, I mentioned the fact that some groups are doing just milk avoidance. When you're looking at milk avoidance, here's what happens with swallowed reticosone. Most patients get better. Here's what happens with milk avoidance alone. Again, a lot of patients get better. So rather than doing milk, egg, wheat, peanuts, peanuts, fish, shellfish, and soy, why are you just avoiding milk? And I think that's a good first potential shot, and hence that's one of, the, one of the aspects that we're doing with our current study. Our current study basically is start off with milk, if that fails, expand out to something a bit bigger. If that fails, then we consider adding swallowed steroids on top of that. That's the 
very short version of that study. Now, the thing that you're trying to avoid is this, the repeated esophageal dilations. This is, again, work out of Dr. Dillon's group. And this is time to first dilation after, for time to your second dilation, I mean. So for here, it's six months and nine months, and this percent of patients have had a second dilation done. Then there are third dilation, which would be about a year or two later after that. Again, a lot of dilations, and it's going to probably be a continuing process where you're literally ripping the sides of the esophagus to basically make it easier for the patients to eat. So the goal for therapies, because these are adults who are being diagnosed late, again, you know, I would like to try to prevent that by using the swallowed steroid therapy and dietary therapy. Keep your esophagus as normal as possible for as long as possible. Um, certainly can be, certainly improve symptoms easily, but that's what you're trying to avoid with uh, implementing in those therapies. As far as conclusions are concerned, um, more or less in time, uh, we have eosinophils and mast cells are increased. We also have treatment with wild steroids and dietary therapies being effective. PPR, PPI RE looks just like EOE, but response high dose PPI therapy. Can't really tell you which way to go uh, with regards to using PPIs anymore in that patient, patient population because of the problems that they're being seen as far as bones and cholesterol things as far as proton uh, pumping are concerned. And it's becoming more and more difficult to try to decide what we want to do with it anymore. EOE is certainly present in African American populations. I'd say it's probably present in all patient populations. It's just a fa function of looking for it when you have symptoms that mer merit it. Uh, when you have EOE CTD, you have Ehlers Danlos type 3, just mild, mild symptoms. You gotta warn patients about that. Start making that diagnosis because they'll start looking and say, oh my goodness, I've got this bad disease. It's not. Marfan syndrome or the Lois Dietz syndrome. Uh, Lois Dietz syndrome is kind of a version of Marfan syndrome that uh, I believe relies on activating mutations in the TGF beta receptors. And we have that eightfold increased risk. Now back to our case study. What would I have done? Well, for that type of patient, I would go ahead and do a gastroenterology consultation. Um, I would discuss the need to, with PPI beforehand. Endoscopy with or without PPI probe, and that's something you have to really work with the gastroenterologist about that. Variant swallow studies for patients who you think might actually have some structural reasons as a, con as a cause of their vomiting. Parasite evaluations if their history merits it. PVC with differential counts can be useful if you see eosinophilia in a patient who's got vomiting and there's other things going on. Say, okay, that might be a little bit more to make you think about it. It's not useful as a tool in the vast majority of patients who are saying you have or have not had active disease. That's one issue that you do want to influence. I throw you on a six free elimination diet. You get better avoiding all those foods. Then we introduce those foods. I give you back weed, I give you back yeah, If you have symptoms, that's going to be a food that I'm not going to give you, let you have anymore. And we see which is the most unrestricted diet I can give you to achieve control. Um, problem is, the only way I can find out is either you actually have active symptoms or you've gone three months without any active symptoms and then there's a biopsy. That's the next food, the next food, and the next food. I don't have any test, and that's a blood test that says, aha, you actually responded poorly to this food, or, you, or, you, or you, that food didn't cause you any problems at all. That would be probably the next big thing as far as EOE therapy, to reduce the number of endoscopies that these patients are having to, that are required for that. Just for some questions. I will mention that I am doing a study on what's far in patients in EOE. So if you have somebody who might be interested who is between 5 and 25 years old, give me a ring. And let my questions go. Hmm. My questions are just saying, here we are. So, question number one, which of the following statements are true? Uh, what do we have for A? And show of hands for A, everybody? That's esophageal mast cell counts are increased when patients with EOE. That's true. The mere presence of 15 eosinophils per hyperfill in the esophagus alone is sufficient to make a diagnosis of eosinophilic hepatitis. I think the mirror is a tip off. Um, there is an increased risk of eosinophilic esophagitis in patients with an immediate family member diagnosed with disease. Uh, that's going to be E, A and C. The next question 
there is an increased risk of esophagitis in patients with connective tissue disorders such as Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and Crohn's disease. I think the videos were tip off, too. Yes, there is that kind of a problem. Then you have uh, which of the following statements are true. Uh, incidence of esophagitis is similar to the bad inflammatory bowel disease. Not true. Uh, there is a pre predominance of esophagitis. Yeah, that's true, too. Common symptoms of earwear include vomiting, abdominal pain, and feeding difficulties. Uh, I think the answer is D. Not quite, quite as clear as the other ones were, but that's what makes it difficult someplace. Last question. Select a single true statement below. Esophagitis can be treated with dietary restrictions, while steroid therapy and esophageal dilation. Answer, no um, Onions are commonly associated with worsening the effects of esophagitis. Yeah, no, I don't think so, okay. Um, effective dietary restriction is easier to achieve. No, uh, made it easy again. So again, that's your final answer. I'd like to thank my collaborators, uh, who are also very uh, helpful in doing all some of the work that was described today, with Dr. Rock Rothenberg being my mentor and uh, primary helper as far as EOU is concerned. Uh, questions for the group? Thank you very much. Uh, I think one of the things that strikes me is as we learn more over time about this disorder and others, there, there are situations like young children who are picky eaters that we would have attributed to behavioral family dynamic issues, and maybe sometimes they are, but now we know there may be something underlying. So you want to just comment on that briefly? So when you're looking at the familial issues, and particularly for patients where there's some socioeconomic reasons for when they're poor or impoverished, yeah, you might say, okay, from a social dynamic, they're going to have problems with feeling intolerance. But if you're starting to see issues where they clearly have eczema, they clearly have problems with vomiting going on, um, and uh, those kind of issues, I'd say, okay, I might want to think about other problems going on with that and say, do that, does this patient need an EDD? I'd be a little bit more willing to pull that gun in that type of a patient. Um, there are a variety of reasons for it to be happening, and from my perspective, it's a perfectly reasonable concern. Depending upon how young they are, if they're very young, I'd say, okay, we'll just have to worry, work on the elemental formulas or whatever formula I have to deal with to get them up to an age where I'm willing to have one of my GI specialists go ahead and do uh, endoscopy on them. Maybe totally foreign to you or not, but I, I work in the newborn nursery, and one of the most common rashes we see is erythema toxicum, which is a rash that has a bunch of eosinophils in it. Is there any anything that we should be knowing about that? Um, I usually don't worry too much about eosinophil toxicum, obviously, and neither are you. But as far as eosinophil toxicum is in this patient population, we've never asked the question, does that actually occur in a lot of these patients? Certainly eczema is there, certainly hives are there. Um, Eczema is usually, most of the times, moderate, but however, sometimes it can be fairly severe. I have a lot of patients with you who have severe eczema, but they're not the bulk of the patient population. Most of them have moderate, moderate to maybe mild eczema, if they have it at all. Um, so you do have problems with the eosinophilia there. You certainly have problems with increased IgEs. That's the other issue that I oftentimes will get IgEs with us, and if they get 800, 1,000, and I got probably 10 to 20 patients who got the IgE level is greater than 10,000, which is way, way in excess of what it's supposed to be. So I'm constantly fielding questions. Do I have Job syndrome? Do I have hyper IgE syndrome? You just have bad eczema, and as a consequence, you have uh, problems with the uh, eczema. I have a question that might be good to clarify for everyone. Um, when you do the elimination diet, regardless if it's the six food or just milk, how long do you usually do the trial for? Um, three months is what we do between any sort of interval change for most, for the most part. So you diagnose the EOE, you do the sets food elimination diet, and three months later we do a repeat endoscopy to determine whether or not that's been effective therapy uh, in terms of not just in terms of the biopsy and endoscopy. If those have improved and the symptoms have improved, you actually achieved something. Three months later, you have a repeat endoscopy on the introduced foods, or if 
the uh, force field to allow multiple formula, uh, and seeing whether or not that's effective. Once you have an effective diet, you basically start reintroducing foods uh, roughly every three months or so, depending upon which food it is. Um, it's most of the time three months. The only the caveat, the only single obvious caveat to that is wheat. Wheat tends to take a longer time to show up and a longer time to go away. So once we achieve normalcy, uh, well, if you're doing a wheat trial, your wheat trial is going to probably be on for a long time, so long as you don't have symptoms. So if you're symptom free, uh, we'll repeat the scope either in three to six months, uh, sometimes as long as a year before we clearly establish that that wheat's a problem. It's the only food that's like that. None of the other foods are really quite so similar. Um, most of those foods are done individually. In patients who are on extremely restricted diets, as a consequence of having too much testing on them, we will sometimes do a bunch of foods together, like a bunch of fruits together, a bunch of vegetables together. That's something that we will do. But if I'm telling anybody to do anything, it's really going to be the empirical information diet. And from there, it just makes life so much easier to work with. You, you sit, see, 70 face, sit, see, 70 percent of those patients are going to get better. So I could shoot at every other little food left over than 30 to 40 percent. But for me, it just makes far more sense to look at those foods. I think that's our time for the morning. Thank you.